Well, happy Easter. And it's so strange not being able to be together, but I pray that you'll have a meaningful time nonetheless. As always, if you hit subscribe below, then you'll be able to catch up with all the videos as they come. And feel free to share them with anyone that you think might be encouraged. Well, my Easter message is this. Christianity is a load of rubbish. Unless Jesus rose from the dead. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 14. He says, if Christ did not raise, then our faith is a waste of time. If Christ didn't raise from the dead, then every church is just a memorial to a dead prophet. And we're all fools. But if Christ did rise from the dead, if everything that he said and did is true, then that demands our attention. In the 18th century, there was a writer called Gilbert West, who was employed by Lord Littleton to disprove the resurrection. And halfway through his research, he met Jesus and he became a Christian and wrote the book, The Evidence for the Resurrection. In the 19th century, an army general called Lew Wallace set out to disprove Christianity. And halfway through, he met Jesus and wrote his book, Ben-Hur which was later made into one of the most successful films of all time, starring Charlton Heston. In the 20th century, a lawyer named Frank Morrison set out to disprove the gospel. And halfway through, he met Jesus and became a Christian and wrote the book, Who Moved the Stone? In the 21st century, the journalist Lee Strobel set out to disprove the resurrection. And guess what? He met Jesus and he wrote the book, The Case for Christ which has sold over 10 million copies worldwide and made into a 2017 film starring Faye Dunaway. As C.S. Lewis put it, Christianity, if false, is of no importance. But if true, it's of vital importance. What it cannot be is moderately important. Our reading for today is from Romans 6, verses 5 to 11. Christ died, and we have been joined with him by dying too. So we will also be joined with him by rising from the dead as he did. We know that our old life died with Christ on the cross, so that our sinful selves would have no power over us, and we would not be slaves to sin. Anyone who has died is made free from sin's control. If we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. Christ was raised from the dead and we know that he cannot die again. Death has no power over him now. Yes, when Christ died, he died to defeat the power of sin just once, enough for all time. He now has a new life and his new life is with God. In the same way, you should see yourselves as being dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Jesus Christ. Question. What have the following people got in common? Elton John, Madonna, Naomi Campbell, Wayne Rooney, and the Pope. Any ideas? Elton John, Naomi Campbell, Madonna, Wayne Rooney, and the Pope. Have a little think about it, I'll tell you the answer at the end. If you're super keen and you're watching this video on the day it was released, then it's Good Friday. Why is it called Good Friday when it's such a horrific day when Jesus died on a cross? Well, it's because it solved a really bad situation. And in order to know how good it is, you have to realise how bad the situation is. You have to understand the problem. And the problem that faces every human is called sin. If I asked you to name the worst problems in the world, you might come up with war or famine or terrorism or abuse. And all of those things can be traced back to sin. No doubt even the coronavirus has some elements where sin was at the heart of it. But the Bible says in Romans 3.23 that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin is the things that we do wrong. It's the, the ways that we're selfish 
the good things that we ought to do that we don't. It's spelt S-I-N. I in the center of my life. I in control of my life. Well, so what? We're all sinners. We're all human. What does it matter? Well, it matters because of the consequences of sin. One of the positive outcomes of this virus is the impact on the environment. And we're flying less and we're driving less. And that seems to be having a a good effect. And as Christians, creation care ought to be a really big issue for us. But, you know, the Bible says that we also pollute ourselves. In Mark 7, Jesus put it like this. He said, what comes out of a person is what makes them unclean. For from within, from the heart comes sexual immorality and greed and malice, deceit and envy and arrogance and folly. All these evils, says Jesus, come from inside and make a person unclean. The passage that was read earlier goes even further. Verse 6 says everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now we all know that drugs and alcohol can be addictive but we can also become addicted to thought patterns and behavior that on our own we just can't seem to break free from. The evangelist J. John puts it like this. He says sin will take you further than you want to go. It will teach you more than you want to know. It will cost you more than you want to pay. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. Sarah and I were watching a BBC documentary a little while ago about the breakup of relationships and how affairs cause so much damage. And one man afterwards said this. He said, if I had known the consequences, if I had known what it would cost, I would never have walked across that room at that office party. I would have run a million miles. But actually these consequences are minor compared to the ultimate consequence of sin. A few verses later in verse 23, Paul puts it like this. He says, the final cost of sin is death. And the sure way of knowing that someone is a sinner is that eventually they die. It's why Jesus couldn't stay dead because he hadn't sinned. As verse 9 puts it, death had no claim over him, but it has a claim over us. And so my message of hope and joy this Easter is that we're all sinners and we're all going to (laughs) die. I was thinking about going into motivational speaking. What do you think? Well, of course, it's not the end of the story. Easter is about good news. The word gospel means good news. And the good news is that God loves us so much that he doesn't leave us in the mess that we've made. He did something. And so once you know the problem, you can then understand the solution. And the solution is that God gave his only son who came to earth to die in our place as our substitute. You see, the death that Paul speaks about, it's not just physical death, it's also spiritual death. Our sin separates us from God. It's like when you fall out with a friend or a family member, there's a There's a distance there. You can't quite look them in the eye. There's a separation. And that's why God seems so far away sometimes. Why perhaps you find it hard to believe. Because our sin disconnects us from God. But the result of the resurrection is that the way is now open to know God in a personal way. To reconnect with our Father God, to know that you're never alone, to know peace through the storm and the promise of eternal life when this life is through. And that really is good news. Last week, I quoted John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. But actually, it's even more personal than that. Paul talks in Galatians 2.20 about the son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. And so Easter is an intensely personal day. Someone put it like this. Imagine you landed on a new planet. 
no one had ever visited before you arrive, and you find that 15 million stones have been stacked up in a perfect triangle. Now, it's conceivable that 150 million years before some event happened on that planet and the, the circumstances were just right, that just by chance the stones formed that way. But then you go a bit closer and there's a little note on the bottom of the stones. And if you're Sue, the note says, Dear Sue, I did this to get your attention. I've been waiting for you. That makes all the difference. Suddenly it becomes personal. And Jesus would come to you today with four words. The words that he says in Revelation 2 verse 9, and they're these. I know your affliction. What power there are in those two words. I know. And your friends say to you, oh, oh, I know how you must be feeling. And you think, no, you don't. How could you possibly? But Jesus says, I know. He knows your pain. He understands what you've been through in the way that no one else does. How does he know? Well, the verse before Revelation 2.9 is Revelation 2.8, which says this. These are the words of him who was dead and rose again. I know your affliction. He's even conquered death, your greatest enemy, your greatest fear. So he's well able to handle whatever you're going through. He's got you. He's got you. I'm going to start to come into land with a true story, and it's from Philip Yancey, one of my favourite writers. And in his book, Reaching for the Invisible God, he talks about Betsy. And Betsy lives in a nursing home and she's got advanced Alzheimer's. And Philip Yancey's wife, Janet, goes there once a month to take a little service for the residents. And Betsy introduces herself every time she doesn't remember she's ever met Janet last time. But they soon worked out that Betsy has retained her ability to read. And she actually quite likes to read out loud, even though she doesn't usually understand what she's reading. And so at the start of the little service, they got into the habit of giving Betsy the hymn and she would read it out loud before they sung it. This one particular time, the hymn they chose was The Old Rugged Cross. And they gave the book to Betsy to read and she started. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And then she stopped and she said, I can't go on. It's too sad. Well, everyone was amazed. It was the first lucid thing Betsy had said for months. But she started again. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. Again, she stopped. A little tear rolled down her eye and she said, I can't go on. It's too sad. Well, the staff came and they took the book off her and, and they carried on with the service. But a little while later, Betsy started to get irritated and start to, to move. And, and then she started to sing at the top of her voice. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down and I'll cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it some day for a crown. Everyone was amazed. Somehow in the brokenness of her mind, Betsy had made a connection. Suffering and shame. Those two words just about summed Betsy up. Who knew what she'd been through? Who knew more suffering and shame than Betsy? Jesus does. I know your affliction. So to the question, what have the following got in common? Elton John, Madonna, Naomi Campbell, Wayne Rooney and the Pope? Well, the answer is that they all wear a cross around their neck. Have you ever thought it was a bit weird that people wear a symbol of execution as jewellery? Well, it's easy to wear a cross around your neck, but Jesus didn't wear it around his neck. He wore it on his back. Big difference. So the only question left is, what is our response? I used to have a picture up in my office of Michelangelo's The Creation of Adam. 
And I wonder if you've ever noticed that God in the picture is straining with every fibre of his being to reach out to Adam. And all Adam would need to do is raise a finger and they would touch. And sometimes that's how we are with God. So near and yet so far. So I'm inviting you today to stand and be counted. To surrender to Jesus for the first time or the hundredth. And to know his resurrection power in your life. I'm going to lead you in a short prayer and I just invite you to pray it after me. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I need you. I am sorry for my sin. I know I cannot save myself. Thank you for dying for me. I receive your forgiveness and invite you to be Lord of my life as best I know how. I give you my heart. Amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer, then drop me a message and I'd love to talk and pray with you. But however you're spending it, have a great Easter. God bless.